Welcome to my presentation, Professional Philosophy of Health Education for the course HSC 6037 at the University of Florida. I'm Cynthia and I'm happy to share my story with you. Thanks for being here. First, I wanna ask you a question. Who do you know who's been affected by cancer, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, stroke or heart attack, or Alzheimer's disease or other dementia? And another question for you, do you believe that diet and lifestyle have played a role? I'm deeply concerned for the health of our country and our planet. I believe wholeheartedly that our health systems currently are not working. Patients can receive prescriptions to treat symptoms of chronic conditions, while below the surface, the causes are being unaddressed. We have a sick care system rather than a health care system. According to the WHO and the CDC, most of the chronic diseases plaguing our society at a rapidly increasing pace are largely preventable. As future health education professionals, we can play a valuable role in helping to build a better society. So I wanna share some of my life experiences that have shaped my goals in health education. So the handsome man with the mustache in the picture, that's my father. I'm so blessed to have had so many rich life experiences. In this photo collage, my father was at his retirement celebration after teaching Taekwondo until age 83. After retiring from educational administration, dad continued to be a model for his Taekwondo students and his family with his active lifestyle. Dad's primary mission statement is live with, the, with an indomitable spirit. This is something that I take to heart and the persistent spirit of knowing that every person is strong, competent and capable of doing great things is part of who I am and part of what I believe. Great things are possible for all. While my father continues to have tr a tremendous attitude at age 87, for example, when I call him and I ask, how are you, dad? He always answers, oh, if I were any better, I'd be in serious trouble. And then he laughs. However, two years after he retired from teaching Taekwondo and moving primarily to sitting in his recliner, he had a stroke. Now he uses a walker and he needs help from his partner for many of his own self-help tasks. The same year that dad had a stroke, we moved mom into a secure healthcare facility. She had been leaving the house out the window at night to hoard items from dumpsters and trash receptacles. She began, began drinking alcohol heavily and hiding it around the house. She forgot many important life events, including the death of her own grandson. And she forgot many people within our family she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In addition to the alcohol abuse, mom had gone decades without dental treatment and had 20 cavities when she finally went to her dentist. Her poor dental health, along with many other unhealthy lifestyle choices, may have been factors in development of her disease. No one in our family has the APOE E3 or E4 allele for genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's disease, which may, may indicate, according to her neurologist, that the cause of her disease was lifestyle related. Well, then there are my sisters. Both of them are obese and type two diabetic. One sister already had two hip replacements. The other sister has heart failure and she is now bedridden. She suffers constantly in pain from a condition called adhesive arachnoiditis. In addition to many family members, I also developed a health issue. In 2016, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I had surgery and 30 days of radiation treatments, which caused me to experience extreme 
fatigue that was absolutely devastating. Prior to my diagnosis, I thought I was living the healthiest of lifestyles. I was working on a master's in counseling while working as a teacher. I was certain that two to four hours of sleep per night would be adequate. In addition, the stress that my fellow teachers and I under, were under at work was enormous. I thought my diet was great, but microwavable meals and plastic containers on a daily basis is not truly a healthy food choice. I did not know that I was contributing to the development of my own cancer. When I was diagnosed, my doctor said, oh no, another teacher. And she hugged me and she said, what is going on? It has to be the stress. In my family and in my friends, health was deteriorating all around me. I was fraught with sorrow. This played a significant role in my desire to help improve human health. In addition, as a teacher, I watched my students suffer. Over the past 20 years, being a teacher in the school with the highest poverty rate in our district, with 30% of our students from affluent families and the other 70% from families with low socioeconomic status, I saw students suffering from food insecurity on a regular basis. One day, two hours after school was out, I looked out my classroom window to see a group of six African-American students crowded around a single hot dog from a nearby convenience store. They were working on sharing it amongst themselves. Another day in the morning on my way to work, I stopped for gas a block away from school to see a young mother hand her toddler an enormous bag of Doritos to eat for breakfast. On yet another occasion, I had a student arrive late to school on a Monday morning. He went to the cafeteria and was provided a school breakfast to eat in the classroom. He was eating so fast that he vomited. As I helped him clean up, he explained he was crying because he knew he would have to be sent home and there was no food there. The concerns for having food and a safe place to live were real threats to my students on a regular basis. These experiences enlightened my ability to have compassion for people who are struggling to survive. This is the population with whom I most wish to serve. My students who came from homes with money had sports, martial arts, swimming lessons, private music lessons, and high quality foods. My students from lower socioeconomic status rarely brought food to school, but when they did, it was from a convenience store or a fast food restaurant. My students from high socioeconomic status flourished and had opportunities to travel, receive instruction in multiple languages, had access to high quality media and technology tools, and they had support and access to excellent health care. My students with low socioeconomic status had poor access to nutritious foods, and there were many other environmental factors that were preventing my students with low SES from attaining access to good health, including untreated trauma, substance abuse issues, eviction, and homelessness. The car, car icon is there because many of my students had no transportation in their family other than walking. One of the families I worked with had a family of five living in a car. Among the teachers and social workers at my school, we were, to able to, we were able to help them out of that situation. So access to mental health is also an issue for my students. And I do wanna stress that many of my students with higher socioeconomic status also had mental health issues. However, they received prompt medical and psychiatric care as it was needed. 
Additionally, there were many more of my students from lower socioeconomic status who had issues with mental health, and they frequently had to wait up to six months for appointments. They often had difficulties obtaining the necessary medications due to financial problems and transportation issues. Over the past decade, I've seen tremendous increases in violent and inattentive student behaviors. Explosive outbursts were very common in our school building. Students falling asleep in class was also a problem. Family living conditions were often apartments with mold, bed bugs, and cockroaches. And multiple families often shared a small residence <clears throat> with children falling asleep on floors, not beds, and also sleeping on couches and chairs. It was time to make a change and do something to help the health crisis I was witnessing all around me. <clears throat> I took a leap of faith. I quit my teaching job to start this health education and behavior graduate program at the University of Florida. I absolutely had to help somehow. I felt called to do this. I'd been reading and listening to podcasts by doctors and nutritionists and learned so much information and as I learned, I found more and more stories of reversal of chronic conditions, such as type two diabetes and even multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. I will share some of the examples that inspired me. I've been deeply moved to grow and expand my knowledge in order to help others. One success story that greatly inspired me was that of Dr. Terry Walls. Dr. Walls was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She was told there was no cure and that she would progressively lose the use of her mind due to brain shrinkage and lose the use of her muscles. By diving deep into the brain research on PubMed, she developed her own protocol, starting with dietary changes and nutritional supplementation. Dr. Walls went from a wheelchair in 2004 to being able to walk and bike 18 miles in 2007. Dr. Walls now does her own research, trains physicians, and works with many patients with neurodegenerative conditions, such as Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. She is experiencing great success. When mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I searched for research in PubMed and I found Dr. Dale Bredesen. I read both of his books, which is The End of Alzheimer's and his second book was The End of Alzheimer's Program. <clears throat> I was thrilled to read about patients who implemented his protocol and reversed symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, including patients who regained speech. This was another inspirational sor source of research, which indicated there, there was hope for treatment for an irreversible neurodegenerative condition such as Alzheimer's. Has a book ever made a profound impact on your life? The book Limitless has for me. Jim Quick suffered a traumatic brain injury as a kindergartner and was learning disabled his entire elementary and high school career. And he struggled with learning to read. His teachers called him the boy with the broken brain. Jim Quick was motivated by his desire to not disappoint his family who were immigrants that had given their lives to help their family succeed in the United States. Although he suffered two more brain injuries, he was able to overcome his health issues and now teaches others how to learn, read faster and improve their memories. Jim Quick is a memory and learning expert and he does memory feats and speaks to audiences of hundreds. And he does feats such as memorizing all of their names 
or recalling hundreds of random numbers they provide. He has a podcast called Quick Brain, and he teaches both adults and children ways to learn better and be better readers. Jim Quick's book, Limitless, was deeply meaningful to me and helped empower me to make the choice to enter the field of health education. So I am a white woman of privilege. Why would anyone of color choose to trust me? I love the image on this slide because it stresses that trust must be built. In the United States, social injustice, inequality, and police violence are at the forefront of our nation's awareness. We have a long-standing history of oppression, abuse, and systematic racism within healthcare. As a teacher, I had families who had an enormous wall between them and school. They had no reason to trust teachers since their experiences with schools were negative ones. It was my obligation as a teacher to demonstrate to them that I cared deeply about their children and their education. I had the responsibility to build trust. Now my role will be to help build trust among communities who have been so often underserved or hurt in the past. This will be essential to any program that I work on developing, and it will be well worth the time and effort. Knowing what will motivate people and what their own personal goals are for health and providing them with meaningful information and resources related to their health, their lives, and their families is a necessity. If people do not understand the health implications of a fast food diet and sedentary lifestyle, why would they want to change? When people have knowledge, skills, resources, and support to make changes, they can become empowered to do so. I believe it is all about collaboration and connection. My dream is to connect with people, organizations, community leaders, healthcare providers, and policymakers to build meaningful health improvement projects that will positively and significantly impact members of underserved communities. In my past work as a program director, I saw the power of networking firsthand, corroborating with schools, churches, and other service organizations. We were able to attain staff training, grant funding, donated materials and services, and volunteer support. So I want to end my presentation with a bit of both my mom's and my dad's spirits since their inspirational qualities will help me to be an awe-inspiring health education collaborator. Everyone is absolutely precious and limitless. So I will help perpetuate the indomitable spirit like my father has. Last, I want to end with a very brief video of mom's view of life. Mom has Alzheimer's. She doesn't know the names of most of her family members or her own husband. Her long and short-term memories have been ravaged. But she becomes confused. She makes up elaborate stories at times. However, mom's spirit is incredible. I admire her so much. Although her brain and body are severely affected by her disease, her loving qualities remain. In just a minute's worth of video time, you will hear mom's sense of humor, her love and joy, her deep sense of gratitude, and even complimentary appreciation for the lawn care, the lawn care worker who passed as I was filming her. As a health education professional, I will keep both dad's and mom's spirits alive within my work. Their legacies of love and inspiration will continue in the world with me as a vehicle. Like my mother, 
I believe in each person's unique, powerful inner light, and I will do all that I can to brighten, empower, and illuminate inner strength. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy watching my mother. So what else do you think about life? What? Tell me what else you think about life. What I think about life? Yes. I've had a wonderful children. I've got wonderful family, and I'm so proud of every one of my kids, and my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. I'm so proud, and I'm so pleased. I've had a wonderful life. The Lord has been good to me. And you are... You do good work, young man. <laughs> you can't hear me. No, he, no he's, she's talking to the yard worker. <laughs> You're always complimenting everyone, aren't you? I try to be. Yeah, I hear because you. You're life so is not easy for anyone. We all work hard to stay busy and kind and good. Oh, we, we praise your, the Lord. We need your attitude. I love you so much. Oh, ditto, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> You're my precious. Oh.